you know, Google Hangouts and stuff, but actually being away from the camera. It's kind of difficult. All right, good to go? Yep. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, here physically and digitally. My name is Ben Legrone. I work as the social studies, the secondary social studies teacher on special assignment here for Springdale Schools. And it looks like everybody here is Springdale family. I don't know who our guests are online, but welcome. This is, um, this session is titled Leading a PBL Implementation Effort. This is designed, tailor made, to uh, facilitate a discussion here later on between us um, as admin of how, how we can successfully implement PBL, project based learning. Um, I came from Rogers New Technology High School before now, before I worked at Springdale. And I have a lot of experience with one to one teaching, interdisciplinary teaching. I, I'm a social study, I was a social yeah, studies teacher, but I taught full time with an English teacher every day. Um, and love PBL. Came from that came from a model where it was it was expected that we were engaging our students in projects. Um, Rogers New Tech is a part of a network of New Tech schools uh, around the nation, um, but they are by no means the only schools doing PBL. The PBL is, a, is spreading all across the nation. There's many different types of um, networks, initiatives going on. Some are you know, centralized as like a top-down model. Some are just simply you know, buildings out there grabbing a hold of resource on the internet and, and doing it themselves. Um, but it was really interesting for me coming to that school and seeing <coughs> kind of some successes and also some growth opportunities in how PBL is implemented. And then when I came to Springdale, I was kind of recruited at Springdale for just some of my knowledge in project-based learning. And then I've gotten to work really closely with School of Innovation, which has been an absolute blast. And I love what we're doing here with School of Innovation. And uh, even started to work a little bit with Sonora Middle School um, so, Yay. all right, so what, what I'm going to do is kind of just go through some slides. We're going to read some material, but my main goal is to get at the end where we can kind of Q&A. Um, it's going to be kind of fast and furious. I mean, it's only 45 minutes. Um, but by all means, since everybody in this room, uh, we work in the same district, by all means, we can set up a meeting, call me up, email me, and we can talk further about your building's needs. So, um, all right, ready to roll. Here was the link, if you didn't get that, to access the slides. There's also, I have it printed on paper, so if you just want to grab it off of there. I'm going to put all these printouts over here if you want them. You don't have to have the printouts because they're going to be linked into the Google Slides, but if you want to go that route, they're right here. If you're embarrassed to use paper at a tech institute, you can just say your computer's dead. Okay. Um, one does not simply implement PBL without proper training and support. Specifically, talking about our teachers. They're not going to be successful without the right training and without the right support from you as admin. Not just support in like the emotional sense, but systemically, um, in a curricular sense. We have to think as leaders if we want to see um, a certain model, or not even the entire model, but certain elements of the model, we have to really think thoroughly about the implications for our building and specifically what's in place. It's really easy to start a project based school from the ground up because you just start from the ground up. Well, I wouldn't say easy, it's not the right word. Uh, easier uh, than having to figure out a way to transition. Um, you're building toward a certain approach. And there's a lot of different techniques and, and perspectives of how that transition might need to take place. And it really differs on who you are and what your building is like. First off, right off the bat, I want to point you to just two resources. There's many more online, but my favorite resources, this book, which is uh, published by the Buck Institute for Education. If you've never been to their website, bie.org, you should go there. It's kind of like the the biggest open free PBL resource out there. Uh, a lot of the a lot of PBL networks like New Tech that I used to work in, like their stuff's kind of closed up because it's well not all their stuff. They release a lot of things, but you know they design stuff specifically for the buildings they work for, you know work with, 
which is understandable. Buck Institute is an um, organization. They, they release everything. And they do have like uh, consultants, and they do go work for schools and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of great stuff at their website. And then they, some of their guys got together and wrote this book. I'd say it's one of the best, just comprehensive, it's concise, and it'll just, it's a pretty quick read, but very helpful and not real fluffy. There's a lot of fluffy stuff out there on PBL. And we're going to talk about that fluff here in a minute. Um, so, great book. And then Edutopia, you probably know about Edutopia, but it's like the greatest website ever. And it's founded by George Lucas. I mean, does it get any better than that? So, um, gotta love George Lucas. So, I love that meme. Just keep calm, read Edutopia. Edutopia has a lot of outside the box type of thinking. So, what is. PBL, great question. I'm going to give you a little bit of the stuff that I'm going to deliver some of the teachers later on uh, coming to the projects versus project versus project, but, uh, project based learning session. So some of this is going to be a little bit of like what is PBL, kind of crash course, and then we're going to get into implications for your building. So some of you have seen this video. I like it. Okay, no sound. I'm plugged in. Up here, sir. Do I need to turn speakers on or anything? Any thoughts? No thoughts? Okay. Um, hmm. Is it supposed to work plugging into the building, uh, the wall, I mean? Seems so. Okay. Second, let me try that one more time. In the right headphone jack. Okay. We're frozen up. All right, we're going to skip that because my computer's freezing up. It's old and cranky. I didn't like to be redirected. And now it's set. There we go. Good job. Okay, so you have the slides. You can watch the video later. It's a really good little three minute explainer on just good PBL. And it it's, has a cool little anecdote about a teacher that actually had really successful test scores, um, great students in his class, but he realized he's having trouble engaging his kids and decided to take more real world ap approach to his content. And it just kind of takes you through a little story of the project. And, and bringing in some business leaders, and it was really awesome. So, what's the dictionary definition of PBL you need to know to pass the test? Okay, PBL is a teaching method which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate, respond to a complex question, problem, or challenge. That sounds nice and pretty. Let's get more down to the rationale. Why do we do PBL? Why are schools talking about it? Because it's like the big buzzword, you know, the new hot thing. Um, a lot of people want to ask, the, especially admin, want to ask the question, does it raise test scores? Which is, you know, one of, the, one of the questions, it's almost like the system teaches us to ask. It's like it influences our thinking to think. If it, if it raises standardized test scores, it's good, which is kind of insanity. But um, to address that question, there's plenty of research out there that you can, you can use to say that PBL raises test scores. There's plenty of research to say that it doesn't necessarily raise test scores. There's not any research, there's not any research that says PBL lowers test scores. Um, so if test scores are all you're concerned with, which I know you're not because you're excellent leaders working in this district, um, but if, that, if there's anyone out there in the world only concerned about that, they can rest assured that PBL is not going to make your test scores go down. Now, as you know, just by any educational resource, uh, research, looking at only um, standardized tests is an indicator of success. It's just kind of crazy. So what else does research uh, show that's, that's, that's pretty um, lengthy and backed up? Here's some pretty solid evidence. PBL engages students better, hands down, no questions asked. I've witnessed it myself. Students are more engaged because they're dealing with real world problems and they're being challenged in a way that's very unique. Are you going to uh, successfully engage every student 100%? Um, I don't know if there's any model in the entire world that's going to be perfect. I don't think there is. 
And so if there is a student in your building that is absolutely committed to not being engaged, he's, he's going to be hard, he or she is going to be hard to reach whether you're doing PBL or not. However, I have personally seen PBL be very effective um, for students that normally wouldn't be. PBL leads to deeper learning that is retained longer. So uh, uh, the big thing with like traditional versus PBL, um, in traditional methods, your students could pass tests with flying colors, but there's a lot of research that shows without, a, without hitting higher level blooms within that process, it's not retained as long. So that's why using, as a teacher, using your own test scores as an indicator of student knowledge is actually not very good. Why don't you give that test two weeks later and see how it goes, okay? But whenever you are experiencing more project-based environment, your learning's deeper because you actually experience it. One thing I like to say is that learning isn't learning until it's applied. So on a test, it's really, yeah, you, you were able to study and study skills are important and get it down on a test, but it's really not deeply held within you until you've learned it. It's just like me, like fixing my lawnmower you know, if anybody's ever worked with small engines, it's loads of fun. Well, it's like I can watch YouTube video after YouTube video to try to figure out how to fix my um, uh, lawnmower until I actually have to go and do it. It's not retained. It's not, you know, um, deep in my knowledge. So it helps ad address higher order standards. Teachers and uh, admin are reporting that they're having an easier time hitting more high level blooms. Build success skills in students. PBL is one of the greatest contexts to have a more holistic approach in your building. So we talk about habits of mind, we talk about collaboration and students have them being more self-motivated, being good communicators. Well, if everything is isolated and segmented and compartmentalized, that's not, very, that's not a very logical school model. Why not figure out models that can be more inclusive to where the learning of the content is blended in with those success skills? And that kind of makes sense with life. Okay, life is not compartmentalized, right? Your communication skills, your collaboration, your ability to work with others, all that stuff's blended together. It leads to more relevant technology use. Projects and technology go hand in hand. Can you have PBL without one-to-one? <clears throat> -one? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, the, and managing technology is really a separate thing from uh, PBL. It's a whole other discussion of how to successfully manage technology you're building. Um, but Projects can allow a more relevant use of that and it not just be, okay, we're going to get the computers out for the sake of getting the computers out. But PBL creates a context where it's required to successfully execute a um, project. Connect students with their community in the real world because they're dealing, if it's well designed, you're dealing with real world issues. And this is one of the most interesting ones. There's strong evidence that PBL actually makes teaching more enjoyable. Um, teachers enjoy uh, moving more toward that facilitation model and, in, and mentoring kids through a project than always just being the deliverer of knowledge. Okay. What does high quality PBL look like? Um, there's another printout I forgot to get, uh, put out. I'll, I'll have it at the end, but it's basically a little two page, two to four page documents explaining what the Buck Institute uses like the mecca, the gold standard as they call it. And there's two elements of, of PBL. Your project design, so basically how you are formulating your project, um, the different components that make it a very deep, deep learning experience, and then project-based teaching practices. What is required of you as a teacher to execute this design successfully? Really bad PBL is just as bad as really bad traditional teaching, okay? And um, if it's not designed well, it, it can be totally disastrous. And I will say by experience, planning projects is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Planning a successful, like really holistic, like clicking on all cylinders, one of the hardest things I've ever done. However, if you're gonna do a project, it actually requires you to plan more in depth than you've ever planned. And that's why it's, it is one of the greatest, it's a great system to force you to do back, backwards planning. Because basically you're doing backwards planning on this project so that you avoid all the chaos that you're anticipating when you're planning this project. And then you find out like once you're ready to launch the project, you're like, wow, all my planning is done. Like 
Now I can actually facilitate learning. Now I can actually have time to look at my formative assessments that I know I should but never have time to. You know, we as admin, or you guys as admin are always, you know, you want your teachers moving toward more formative assessments. Me as a, as a curriculum guy, I'm wanting teachers to use those effectively, but I know what it's like as a teacher and using formative assessments successfully or, you know, um, regularly is pretty hard to do, use it effectively. Projects actually, once you plan well and you've got the thing rolling, it, it allows you the time to actually focus more on the individual student or the individual team and see where they're at. So that's just one example of how it can be really, really hard on the planning end, but it actually frees up a lot of, a lot of it makes you more mobile as a teacher. Are projects in your building dessert or the main course? So when we think about quality um, for you as admin of what to look for, you got to ask yourself, is this dessert or is this the main course? Meaning, are they doing the project at the end of the unit because it's going to kind of cap it off and it's just fun and the kids are engaged, which is fine. It's good to get kids engaged. But the other element of PBL is not just engaging kids. It's, it has to be rigorous. It has to be challenging. I've, when I was uh, doing PBL in a classroom, students told me, this is the hardest class I've ever had in my life. Some students would say, wow, this is... This is like the easiest and the greatest because they were able to plug in and go and they're more independent and could just run with it. But students that were used to being kind of fed everything, like, okay, it's Monday, do this. Okay, it's Tuesday, do this. Okay, it's Wednesday, do this. They act, now they have to back up and like actually plan out what they're going to do to accomplish this task or else. <laughs> I mean, it's a big challenge. I had to, I had, they were being treated more like a functional adult. Um, and students aren't used to that. Now, most of you guys are, are secondary. I think we have a couple elementary, people work elementary. Um, before I just go running off into my secondary world, PBL works at all levels. It looks different. So, and obviously, you could, you could probably conclude that the younger the grades are, the more structured and scaffolded and um, regulated by the teacher. In fact, in elementary, a lot of times they just do class wide projects. They go through the same process that. Uh, you would go through in a regular project, but um, it's facilitated like class-wide. Um, on that note, there's a misconception that PBL is like giving your kids this like scenario and then releasing them and like peace out, see you two weeks later. That's like absolutely not what PBL is. In fact, if you're in a PBL classroom and a teacher is just sitting at their desk, it's just like in a tr traditional room, not doing a very good job. If a teacher's not monitoring the kids and get, I, I call it getting in their business and constantly involved in the process, um, you're not going to get high quality work. Um, so that's a big misconception and PBL teachers are actively engaged in what a project looks like. Here's a really practical graphic for you to understand this dessert versus um, main course. So in traditional learning, Lecture activity quiz, lecture activity quiz, review exam. And if we're lucky, if we have enough time, if maybe there's just magically not a lot going on at the end of the unit or quarter, we just might do a project. Maybe at the end of the year after tests are done and it's, got, you know, we want the kids to kind of relax. We do a project, right? That's the epitome of dessert. Did you really need the dessert? No, you didn't really need it. PBL is designing the project to be the main course. So, and, and very, very simply put, if you were to explain to your teachers, you know, what's the difference between doing projects, uh, PBL, taking that, that project, that assignment, and flipping it to the beginning and saying, all right, kids, this is, what you, this is a scenario you have to um, investigate, you have to, the product you have to create, and then they're going to say, well, we haven't even learned this stuff. And that's you say, that's right. So let's go through a protocol where you communicate to me the things you need to know, you need to learn. And that's how we work in the adult world, okay? Your boss says, hey, I need this. And you don't gripe and complain, well, I don't know how to do that. What do you do? You take responsibility for yourself and you go figure it out, right? You go seek out the resources you need. Now, as a teacher, you've already planned out what those need to knows are, what those need to learns are. You already know what resources they need to ask for. So you guide them along that process. Meaning, if they, don't ask for the, if they don't ask the right questions, that doesn't mean you just you know, let them fall through the cracks. Um, but that's the, really the core of PBL is 
is launching the project at the beginning, they communicate what they need to know and you form your lessons, assessments, everything targeted toward that need to know. So a project launch might look like bringing in a guest speaker, showing a video and doing something really cool to stimulate their interest and then giving them some sort of scenario written down. We call them entry docs, an entry document. And it might have this uh, big scenario that they're having to tackle. And I usually have my kids go through a protocol where they, they like highlight the things that they know and understand content-wise already, underline things they need to know or they have no clue about. Um, and they basically identify their, their knowledge gaps. They do it instead of just the teacher. And then they, you've already got evidence that they created that what they need to know. Whether it's group or individual, um, you know, you think through all those processes of, of how this, how this project's gonna roll out. Basically, the red represents the normal stuff you do in school. So there's another misconception of PBL is that everything's different and you just, you're just like, uh, you just hand the kids a computer and they do all the learning themselves. No, you can take all your traditional lessons, all your, your test quizzes, and you can put it within the context of a project. So my encouragement um, to you, like, as a, as a being able to give tips to teachers is if they're stressed out of the idea of a project, you can tell them, hey, you can use all your traditional stuff. Just think of a project that it, it encompasses. And, and that's how you can uh, plug in the content. Benchmark, benchmark is the word for like, maybe a rough draft or like a, a set in time a assessment that leads to the final product. Sometimes a benchmark for me might even be a quiz, okay, um, or an essay. But this process would continue. Reflection is always important. As John Dewey says, we don't learn by experience, we learn by reflecting on our experience. And at the end, the culminating event should be big, it should be awesome, it should be, uh, it should make kids nervous, <laughs> especially the first time they have this, uh, a culminating event that most likely has like a presentation or some kind of public audience. Bring in guests, bring in authentic audiences. Kids are so used to presenting to teachers, it's like it doesn't mean anything. I've witnessed the power of guests coming in and evaluating presentations and kids take it a lot more seriously. And if a kid is not ready for his presentation that day of the, you know, the culminating event, you got these guests, you got 4029 in your classroom, it's like, really awesome, what do you do? You make him present. What does that kid learn through that experience? It's, 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 it, life's not always pretty. Like, um, um, we're not always gonna just you know, shelter them from an embarrassment. So one of, the beauty, uh, one of the beautiful things about PBL is that it allows kids to go through very adult-like experiences, like getting embarrassed and having to learn from that and having to change their behavior, change the way that they manage themselves so they can avoid some of those experiences. And we always provide time for reflection. So this is a great, great graphic. You can even show this to your teacher, uh, teachers in, in a meeting explaining like how projects can um, be implemented. So PBL doesn't replace best practices or all other approaches. It's a vehicle to make instruction more relevant and engaging. So don't toss out everything that's working. You are simply putting it within, putting it in a car that's going to help drive your content down the road and be a lot more fun. Problem-based learning. So that one of the big questions I get from admin and, and teachers is, well, what about math? Well, math is, it often does look a lot different in PBL-oriented schools. In fact, some of them just, they call it PBL, but they might call it problem-based learning. So um, similar concept where you're giving them a problem or scenario they, they communicate what they need to know or their gaps of knowledge. Okay, we've, we've been given this scenario that this local engineering company is dealing with. Okay, some of this I understand. I'm gonna write down and, and highlight what I understand. Here are the areas that I have no clue. Communicate to the teacher and you learn together. It might be a week, it might be, it might be two weeks, and this is really just kind of where in math instruction is going anyway. Um, but it's rare that, that math classes are doing like big epic projects all year. Plenty of schools do a lot of big epic. Um, math projects. A lot of them are really interdisciplinary, merged with math and even other um, subjects. But uh, they're not, they're, it's not as easy to do like big old massive cool projects in math as it is in like the humanities or science. Um, so there's a little Venn diagram that just kind of covers some different similarities, differences. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip through that due to lack of time. So 
How do I implement PBL in my building? Good question. You don't. You can't do it as admin. It has to be your teacher. So the, so the question is, how do I support, how do I train my teachers? How do I cast vision for them? Um, how do I communicate that vision in a way that they feel empowered? One of my favorite words is being empowered. I love the word empowered. Um, because a lot of times in education, we're crippled by our systems, we're crippled by our attitudes, we're crippled by our culture. So it, for me, I'm thinking, how, do I, how can I empower teachers? Where they, it's not just about a feeling, it's like tangible. It has to be tangible empowering, right? Emotion is empowering, inspiration is empowering, but it's not the complete picture. We have to think of the practical implications. So my motto is think big, start small. I think as school leaders, you need to think big. You need to think about the stuff with PBL that, that has massive ramifications uh, long term um, for thinking about transforming your building. But you have to start small. And you, as, a, as you, you go back to your team, you've got to identify what are the small steps we can move towards that. One of the most notorious things of, um, for just us in education is getting excited about an idea and just talking about it a lot. But no practical small steps. I'm a firm believer in if you one step at a time, and you'll get there. Um, can, can are there ways to overhaul an entire building and, and just like, you know, go through at bullet speed? There are, and there's schools that, that do choose to do that. In that book, if if you end up buying that book, <clears throat> they give you some actual scenarios of like different ways people have approached it. Um, but you got to decide what's right for your building. And I think probably the first thing is f is for you to continue to get resource. All right, how leaders paved the way. Consider the foundation. What has already been laid? What, what teachers are already doing PBL may not even know it. It's one thing I've discovered working with a lot of teachers. A lot of them were, were pretty PBL oriented. They just, they just didn't even know it. And it, it's especially true in like the non-core classes, a lot of the business tech classes, East and stuff like that. I mean, they're already, they're already doing PBL. Uh, we were working with <coughs> Sonora the other day and like the East teacher I mean, he's never been through like this formal PBL training that I was doing, and he was a, it was he was able to just like go and help all these teacher teams because in the East, his East initiative like he knows how it rolls. Um, so what's already been laid? Shared ownership, shared leadership, shared success. I highly recommend identifying those teacher leaders, and if this is a serious thing you're considering, like let them come into this this PBL leadership PBL like committee or whatever. Um, bring them into this, get their ideas. How do they think it would be best implemented? Some people like selecting one person from each department to maybe kind of pioneer things. Maybe just one per building. Maybe choosing a department. Some schools actually will just, they pick whatever department is most ready for it and they just all do it and use that as an exemplar. Set goals together. Find evidence of active learning. Publicize success stories. Okay. Are there failure stories? Absolutely. Should you talk about those and communicate them? Yeah, because we should have growth mindset. But at the same time, teachers are, are really empowered when they can see it. If you see it, you can build it. If you just talk about it and you've never seen it, you can't build it. It's just like for you as an administrator. For us as educational leaders, like we can talk about theories all day, but if we've never seen it, you really aren't empowered to build it. You know what I'm saying? If you've never seen a successful school, how do you... How do you build one? If you've never seen good parental involvement, how do you build it? And that begs the question, well, if I've never seen it, how do I see it? You gotta, you gotta be hungry and go find that resource. Go find the thing you need to where you can see it. I mean, nobody starts building a house without seeing the blueprints, right? So think about how can you as an, an administrator find the blueprints? How can you give your teachers the blueprints and not just give them um, ideas. So prioritize collaboration time and I really moving to this district I've just kind of blown away at the amount of collaboration I've seen in, in all levels. I think it's awesome and that's very necessary for teachers to wrestle through PBL. PBL is, is tough. Uh, I call it wrestling because it's like like I was saying earlier even with just planning a project it's hard. Um, teachers need that time to wrestle together and get over the different hurdles. <clears throat> Plan for ongoing PD and, re and reflection. 
So it's, it's not a set in time thing. You, do, you can just do once and you're done. Communication. This is something that was very personal to me because I've been with, you know, and had leaders in the past that, that have said similar things, and I remember how it made me feel. And, and the first one is, let's talk about what not to say, okay? We're going to talk about what not to say and then maybe how to communicate better. So what not to say. Y'all need to be doing more projects. I heard that so much as a teacher before I learned PBL, and it stressed me out. It was just like, what does that mean? Y'all need to be doing more projects and stuff. And it's just like, okay, what is, what is a project to you as my school leader? You, you see on these, it's like, I don't even know what that means. And they didn't know what that means. And they were wonderful human beings, wonderful people. It's just that sometimes how we respond as, as school leaders is like, we feel kind of the pressure from like all these awesome ideas and like, you know, admin, and we just want to kind of like disseminate that. And it's like, we need more projects and hands-on stuff and get your kids engaged. Well, without an actual plan to empower them, it, it, it's actually disempowering. I want to see more hands-on activities. Well, when you say stuff like that, you're actually kind of encouraging them to eat dessert. Because teachers know how to feed kids dessert. They do. Uh, I would say my experience as uh, working with curriculum is, is the younger grades, they, they will feed even more dessert. Middle school and, and elementary, are, they know how to give them the dessert. The main course, PBL, it's pretty hard to, to implement. Y'all should teach the way they do at, insert name of some charter school in Finland or Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, you know, I, on my Twitter feed, I, I love looking at all these innovative schools, but it's like, when you, say that to, when you say that to teachers, it's arbitrary, it's distant, it means nothing. That's when it goes back to finding your success stories in your building. If it's in your building, then it's real to teachers. All right, so how should you communicate? My encouragement is just starting with inquiry. You know, going to a teacher, hey, what lessons this year got your kids most engaged? And they'll probably describe a lesson that is probably kind of project-based, kind of PBL-oriented, you know, surprise, surprise. They're not going to be like, oh, man, I had this, this one textbook chapter that we did, and the kids were just, like, glued to it. You <laughs> probably won't hear that. So, um, Try to, try to meet them where they're at already. What are they already doing that's engaging? Ask teachers, hey, what do you already know about PBL? That's a great question. We assume that teachers know nothing, but you might actually find, you, you might find out that these teachers have actually been on Edutopia and Buckets too. They might know some things and be like, yeah, you know, I've heard of an entry doc and a driving question, and yeah, I'm trying to figure out some of that. So you might, you might um, discover who your PBL gurus are, those kind of questions. Have you ever observed good examples or success stories? And you could even ask them, have you ever observed you know, bad examples? And a lot of the teachers that are skeptic will actually love to jump on that question and, and talk about um, the, the bad examples. And you kind of nod your head and you're like, yeah, you know, PBL, it can be chaotic you know, if you don't manage your class right. Well, what about some success stories? You know, just, you know hey, Mr. And Mrs. Teacher, there's hundreds of schools all over the nation, all over the world doing PBL. What do, you think this, what do you think successful looks like? If there's, if there's a false, there has to be a true, right? So if there's really bad PBL, there has to be good PBL somewhere, right? So having those conversations is key. Have you ever tried any PBL strategies? How did it go? All right, so um, whew, this hour's flying by. What I have is I'm going to kind of monitor and adjust because I want us to have kind of an informal discussion here in a second. In here is linked, um, let me see what page it's linked on. Okay, it's linked on a further page to actual, an actual chapter from this book. And the book chapter is called Leading a PBL Implementation Effort. If you want to grab the printout on your way out, you can. But I'm going to, if you want to write down, or if you have the slides, you'll have it. But there's a few little boxes, the real practical stuff to think about. One of these boxes is talking points. And it has great, just quick talking points you could... Talk to parents, admin, teachers about PBO, behind the rationale, what it might look like. It's really, it's really nice. It's just like a page or two long. And there's some more uh, spots in the book I'm going to point you to in a second. So questions to consider. All right, there's a lot of questions here. I don't have time to discuss them, so I'm just going to kind of read through them, let you kind of mull on it, all right? So questions to consider trying to bring PBL into your building. How will you honor the positive aspects of your existing school culture and teachers' beliefs while leading change, if needed, 
to better align them with PBL practices. So what's your culture like now? Where does it need to go? How can you, lead the, how can you shape the culture? How will you create time for teachers to collaborate on project planning? How will you use structures such as PLCs and peer-led PD to support teachers' ongoing learning? Do you encourage the use of protocols with faculty that remove the walls in your school and encourage feedback? Critical friends protocols, post-project reflections, examining student work, calibration. Um, in other words, is your building a safe place for your teachers to struggle and learn? One of the big topics we talk about in education related to culture is, it is, is it a safe place for students to fail? I, I, had, I knew a teacher once, she, she, she called it failing up. I love that. Can your students fail up? Are they given that opportunity? Is it safe to, for them to, to, you know, be vulnerable, show their work to their students, get feedback? Uh, do you have, does a teacher have the right protocols and the right attitude, the right, um, you know, warmth in their classroom to do that? But I think an even wider question is you're building a safe place for your teachers. Can they actually go into another a teacher's classroom that, that's rocking it and not feel insecure? Do, can your rock star teachers have critical conversations with your other teachers and it, and it go well and not be just super awkward? I think we all know that, like, I know especially I come from the high school, secondary world, like, where teachers are a little more isolated and stuff. I know it's awkward. And the key to overcoming that is, is thinking of protocols and practices that are regular where they can do that. In other words, if you just have one semester meeting, all right, let's all get together and, and like have these crew conversations. I mean, it's not as effective. So be thinking about and go with your team. Think about how can we create a safe culture for our teachers so that if they're trying to do PBL or trying to do anything, for that matter, they feel safe to fail up. Do classroom observations focus on evidence of high quality PBL? One, if you want to kill the, if you want to kill a PBL implementation effort, reward the dessert. Because that's what teachers will give you more of. They'll give you the dessert. So, I mean, I'm sure you know as an administrator, you have to communicate. If you see, if you see the dessert going on, you gotta be like, "Oh man, this is cool. Kids are having fun. This is engaged. This is great." What's some of the learning that's going on? What's, you know, what do you think about the level of rigor? How's this um, playing out for your content? So, if you see dessert, move them toward the more effective, high-quality stuff. How will you help connect your students and teachers with community experts and resources to support PBL efforts? One of the things I appreciated about my former principal is that, um, you know, we as teachers, we would seek out those, those guest speakers and guest evaluators and people to come in and do workshops for us. But he was always thinking about that too. And, and he'd just like email us out, like, hey, I, I was talking to so and so, like some banquet or whatever. And he's, he, you know, he's interested in coming to school. You know, he's a, He's a graphic designer or whatever, and he you know, really likes kids and wants to come do something on graphic design. You know, he kind of kept us updated on, on people that were willing to take off work, because that's the hard part, guys, about trying to get to do that. It's like people taking off work, it's kind of hard to convince them to do that. Um, I would also think about setting aside a little bit of money for like snacks and, and if, some way to, like, to reward people coming in, because I ended up buying all that stuff on my own, because like, if I had guests come in, me and my co-teacher, we'd buy them snacks and drinks, stuff like that. They got kind of costly, but we felt kind of obligated to because they're taking off work. And it depended on how long they were staying, obviously. But um, how will you share PBL success stories within your faculty and with the larger community? So again, we ran out of time, but um, I've given you all this resource. If you're hungry for more of this PBL stuff, there's a lot to read there. You can contact me later. But um, this link will give you this handout. And I've kind of highlighted there some really great uh, discussions. The grading one, the grading one will require me and you to really have a long conversation <laughs> because PBL and grading and, and group versus individual and how to do that effectively can blow up. In fact, one of my uh, sessions tomorrow, I don't know if you signed up for it, is all about that. Just my practical experience. How to effectively assess like a group project but also it, the grade represent individual learning. Um, and there's very simple practical tools to do that. Um, but that's a huge topic. Here's a great article, Edutopia. I'll sum it up for you. Ensuring that PBL is not one more thing. Basically, they, what they encourage you to do is you and your leadership team, you, you need to sit down and, and list every single initiative going on, especially, especially related to instruction. Okay? Think of all these initiatives you're doing and figure out where PBL already correlates. 
Um, don't think of PBL as this thing you just throw into the mix. Try to see where it can be consolidated and where it's like, yo. I mean, like for instance, our, in Springdale we used UBD. Understanding by design correlates perfectly with PBL. It's backwards planning. Um, and the book gives you a good discussion on that, actually, connecting PBL to other initiatives. So it's a similar thing, but it's a, they discuss the protocol in Edgetopia of like when they go into team, uh, leadership teams and they kind of analyze their initiatives together. So, um, all right. What are we going to do? I just want to open up for any Q&A. I know we might all be in a different spectrum of what we think about PBL, but any questions from me, like coming from a PBL school and, and pretty much being a, totally obsessed with it. <laughs> any, any questions on PBL in general or as a leader? Any questions? If you don't ask any questions, I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> All right, so question number one, I, I would appreciate some feedback. What is the what is one thing that is most exciting about this model to you? Why are you in this, this session? For me, I want to see our curriculum get more integrated. And okay. PBL kind of lends itself to that. Um, I've seen a new tech school, and so I love the fact that they're integrating the curriculum and, and using that to get kids to think broader and a bigger mm -hmm. picture and applicational skills as opposed to just memorizing a bunch of content yeah. and going on. Kids don't understand the connection between all of their classes and how they kind of go together. So yeah. I'm very interested in PBL, but I'd like to see it done with integrated content at yeah. the high school level. Which yeah. It's very difficult to do, but. There's a lot of systemic barriers. And even at New Tech, we, we were co teaching up until 11th grade because the scheduling was just like so crazy. Mm -hmm. We're busting kids everywhere, similar to SOI, they're going all over the place. So we, just, we quit doing that. Um, but through that, I learned how to make a lot more interdisciplinary connections. And my dream is actually to try to think of a system that is where it's still isolated, but it's still congruent. But. Uh, like what you said about uh, learning isn't learning until it's applied. Right. And that's where project based learning can really ratchet that up. Yeah. Get students mm -hmm. applying their learning in real world yeah. situations. The teachers always ask me, like, well, how do you get all the standards? I've actually learned that I feel like I hit the standards deeper and better through PBL, and that there was actually a lot of stuff I was doing that what, it was like extra. It wasn't even part of the standards. Because I'd be like teaching French Revolution, I'd be like, well, I think they got to know this, this, and this, and this, and this so that they can do this application. It's like, no. Tell them what the application is, and they will, and then create the path for them to accomplish that. And you're actually more streamlined. You'll end up, you'll, you'll end up teaching less to go deeper. And that's, that's what research shows our brains need. So. I think it allows for individualization of learning in so many different ways. Yeah. And also, not only the real world application, but the life skills they need to mm -hmm. go into the real world. Yeah. Absolutely. Every single professional organization when they're in those meetings about what they wish school was preparing kids for, it's all the soft skills. We call them the soft skills. To me, they're essential skills. They're like life skills. And uh, kids can't communicate, think creatively, step out of the box, grit. You know, if they can't, if they can't have grit, perseverance. I mean, they're really at a disadvantage in the competitive job world. Uh, so. What is one concern, question, kind of like scary obstacle for you thinking about this? Or just something you might be wrestling with? Well, in School of Innovation, we're hiring a bunch of new teachers. Um, and I think my fear, and I'm in IF, is Getting, making sure that we hire the right people that are going to buy into our model and PBL because mm -hmm. they have to be open to that and willing to try and do it and realize it's not going to go perfectly the first time. Yeah. It's going to be a process. Yeah. So. You know, at, at, you go around the nation and look at PBL schools. It They're not always the most brilliant teachers of like, they're the most content savvy and all that. They're just simply flexible. So I think that's a good point for all of us and hiring, like, am I hiring somebody that's flexible, that's open to new ideas, and 
um, not just to fulfill this one little gap I, I have to fill in my schedule. Other questions, concerns, obstacles to wrestling with? Well, um, I think we're supposed to end at 10.50. You guys uh, have my contact info. It's in that, it's in that. Here at the beginning. Um, I thought I had my cell on there. I guess I don't. Uh, but you can email me, and, and if you just want to have a conversation about PBL, because every building's different. Um, you want to think big, you want to start small. Where that, where that exactly is, is really up to you. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. I hope I hope you got something out of this. I hope it generated some thinking. Um, and just let me know how I can help. For those online in the digital world, you can email me as well or tweet, whatever. If you have more questions, um, just let me know. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And I'll see you all around. Thank you. Don't forget, if you want any of those paper handouts, they're there for you.